Although the origin of the word matter is of relatively recent origin, it is intriguing to note that it appears to have been derived from the word mother. One can start from any object to get a glimpse into what matter may be. So for our example, let's use a book. On my desk right now, I have a copy of Roger Penrose's Shadows of the Mind, published by Oxford University Press in 1994. In examining the book, we not only discover a certain hardback binding, a nicely designed dust jacket, but 457 pages filled with small print. However, if we look at just one of the pages within the book, we soon realize that it is made of a fine quality paper, which undoubtedly was derived from some dead tree for the purpose of utilizing its pulp. But what is a tree? A simple definition from a dictionary might explain it thus, a plant having a permanently woody main stem or trunk, ordinarily growing to considerable height and usually developing branches at some distance from the ground. Yet, if we probe further, we discover that such a plant is made up of much smaller constituent parts, such as millions of cells, which in themselves are made of even smaller bits called molecules, which in turn are comprised of billions, nay trillions, of atoms. Indeed, every physical composition on planet Earth is essentially the reconfiguration of atoms. Now the question, what is an atom, will give us a deeper insight into what matter actually is. The term atom was first coined by Democritus, who was influenced no doubt by his teacher Leucippus, who argued that things are made up of indivisible particles, which cannot be cut further. By the turn of the 20th century, this view became modified when Max Planck and others realized that atoms contained smaller bits, such as a nucleus and an electron. And those in turn contained smaller units still, including photons, quarks, and so on. Richard Feynman, the famous physicist and architect behind quantum electrodynamics, once quipped that if we had to reduce all of human knowledge into one intelligible sentence, he would write, Things are made of literal things that jiggle. This is a profound understanding of material structure, and not merely a humorous slogan, as Feynman is getting right to the heart of the issue. Matter isn't just one thing. It is rather a scaffolding project of many layers each of which reveals a different aspect of what matter can do under differing circumstances. For instance, if you are sailing on a 36-foot boat in the Pacific Ocean, there are so many things occurring at once. The blue sky, the luminous sun overhead, the gathering clouds, the increasing onshore winds, the two to three foot waves, the innumerable forms of organic life lying just below the water surface, not to mention the navigating humans on the boat attempting to steer and checking the compass and the GPS device in the cockpit. And in all of these things, they are made of atoms. Reconfigure atoms in a certain way and you get iron. Reconfigure it another way and you get the Taj Mahal. Reconfigure it still more and you get Mount Everest. And reconfigure those same units and you get millions of different species trying their best to adapt to a whole ecosystem which in itself is a larger network of reconfigured atoms. And even the nucleus itself is, contrary to what Democritus opined some 2,600 years ago, divisible. Depending on the element, atoms come in different weights, depending on the number of protons within the nucleus and the number of electrons manifesting outside its chambers. Yet, even when we get to the very core of matter, we find yet another layer and our understanding of what is actually going on turns indeterminate. As Sir Arthur Eddington once stated concerning the strange underpinnings inherent in quantum theory, something unknown is doing what we don't know. Matter is a mystery.